Thank you all. That was wonderful. Good morning, friends. Happy to be with you this morning. My name is Tyler. I'm the pastor here at Grace United Methodist Congregation. Welcome to worship. We are in our fourth of a four-week sermon series uh, that we're calling Imperfect, and it's a look at families, families in the Bible, families uh, that probably in some ways mirror a lot of our own and some of the things that we struggle with or that we're dealing with. And uh, today, I want to change gears a little bit. It's a little bit different kind of sermon than the, the past ones. I want to begin by uh, just asking a quick question. Do we have any uh, basketball fans out there, basketball players? I know we've got a handful, several, maybe some bigger than others. I know we're kind of in a football-dominated place, uh, but basketball is, is now taking over. Two more, three more weeks of the NFL season, and then, and then we're done. And then it's all basketball uh, for a few more months. One of the things uh, that happened that was really interesting uh, last year in the world of professional basketball is that there is a player, there is a player named LaMelo Ball. Some of you have heard of him. LaMelo Ball won the Rookie of the Year Award uh, last year. And he uh, plays for Charlotte, great ball handler, great guard, um, is breaking all kinds of records uh, just in his second year in the NBA. Really a phenomenal player. And uh, the funny thing is, though, about LaMelo Ball, he was not the first player chosen in the draft that year. The, the player that was first chosen was another guard named Anthony Edwards. Um, he came out of Georgia. He is a, a fantastic player too, a, a brand new superstar uh, also. But it was interesting because I follow the team, uh, the Timberwolves, that, that drafted first. They had the very first pick in the draft that year and they picked Anthony Edwards instead of LaMelo Ball. And if you talked to all the people who were trying to, trying to figure out which teams would select which players, they couldn't really decide which team they thought the Timberwolves were going to take. Because both of these players were guards. It was going to be one or the other. And it was a question of, which one do you pick? Now, the interesting thing about LaMelo Ball is that, now, I don't think anybody in the Timberwolves front office would ever, you know, confirm this. But there was some speculation that they might decide to choose Edwards instead of LaMelo Ball because LaMelo's dad, LaVar, is kind of a thing. Some of you who follow basketball have heard of LaVar Ball. You know the deal with him. And he is a force to be reckoned with. He is a helicopter parent of stratospheric proportions. He has had incredible involvement, dare I say, pain in the neck kind of involvement in his children's lives. And he has just, he has pushed his kids to the, the goal all along for his three sons, pro basketball players, superstars, multimillionaires, gazillion dollar endorsement deals. That's the way that they have been programmed from, from the get-go. These boys have been. And so he has been interfering in college recruiting and he has been trying to, to uh, uh, as much as he can sort of manipulate or influence who, who teams draft. And he wants his kids to play for this college and this particular pro team. And he's, he's really been kind of, in, in the minds of some, kind of difficult person to deal with. And so when it came down to who was going to be the first draft pick, you could have this one player who maybe didn't have that going on, and then this other player who came from maybe a very loving family, but dad's kind of a lot to deal with. And would that influence the decision? And depending on who you talk to, the answer is yes. That may have factored in to the deal. LeVar Ball uh, has got his own brand that he has started for he and his family. Um, he has started his own youth basketball league in California, and that's become a big deal. So anyway, you get the idea. And it's, it, I'm not necessarily picking on him. This is, this is the case like for all kinds of things when it comes to parents and some of those parents that are maybe a little bit over-involved in their children's extracurricular activities. You see it in ballet, you see it in theater, you see it in athletics, you see it in academics, and as somebody at the 830 service reminded me, man alive do we see it in the world of pageants, right? So you, you know like this kind of thing, like there are these parents that are just kind of overly invested, maybe living a little vicariously, trying to pull some of the strings, and end up being one that when the coaches or the instructors, the teachers or the other parents see them coming, they kind of look and run the other way. 
So I tell you all this, and you're probably wondering, okay, so what in the world? Let me just say, let's just set the stage for today's gospel reading. From Matthew 20, starting in verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before Jesus, she asked a favor of him, and he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. Jesus called to them, called to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you, you must, must, you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must also be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we've been talking about families this whole month so far. As I said, some of the stories in the Bible are stories that may sound familiar. They may uh, resemble some of our own life circumstances. We talked the first week about Mary and Joseph losing Jesus when he was uh, just a young boy for, for three days in Jerusalem. We talked about the next week, John the Baptist kind of a, a, the black sheep of the family, kind of went off and did his own thing. Uh, very important work, but also something that was a little bit maybe difficult for his parents to wrap their heads around at first. Last week, we talked more about how oftentimes the families that are in the Bible are not the ones who we have an idealized image of what a family should look like, and we recognize that families in the Bible, just like our own families, are complicated, perhaps messy, maybe conflicted at times, but ultimately holy and beautiful, just like our church family. And today I want to shift gears a little bit and look at this story of the mother of James and John. Now, let me be the first to say, I don't fault this woman. I don't fault her at all. I think that most of us who are parents are pretty much hardwired. It's just woven into our, our DNA and our biology that we want what's best for our kids. We just do. If our kids can have an advantage, we usually want to see that happen. If we can make a phone call to make things a little bit better for our kids, maybe we're going to do that. Some parents take the approach where they're going to say, you know, I want my child's, uh, my child's life is going to be complicated enough as it is, so if I can do things while they're younger to help clear obstacles for them, then I'm going to do that. If I can give my kid every advantage and we can send our kids to the best schools and blah, 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 we're going to do that. Other parents take a little bit different approach. Say, my kid's going to have to learn, we're going to let them fall sometimes, we're going to let them fail sometimes, there's going to be some hard knocks, and that's going to prepare them later on in life. Whatever your philosophy, those two are something in the middle, ultimately we want the same things. We want our kids to live successful lives, happy. We want them to, to be productive. We want them to choose, uh, make good choices. We want them to end up uh, in relationships that are, that are life-giving and good. If we are raising them in a household of faith, as I know you are, we want to have that instilled in our children too and that they carry that into their adult lives. And so on the surface, I don't fault the mother of James and John. I imagine her coming up to Jesus and saying, you know, Jesus, I have this favor to ask. And as you heard him say in the story, what is it? My boys are good boys. They really are. I mean, I know you've got 12 disciples, and they're all great, but really, James and John are exceptional. And, well, quite honestly, like when you're talking about this vision that you have for the kingdom and going on to glory and, 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 and you coming into your kingdom, well, can you just save the spot at your right and your left for them? 
And Jesus is listening, and I'm sure that there's a part of him that's maybe just a tad sympathetic because he understands what's going on here. But then he responds in a typical Jesus way, which is a little bit mysterious and a little bit pointed, but also has a teachable feature to it. And he says, are you able to drink from the cup that I drink? Maybe they understand what he's hinting at, maybe not. But the two boys come in and they say, yeah, we can do that. Now, I think that James and John hear that question and they think, are you able to truly sit at my right or left hand? And they're thinking, yes, we have been following you, have been apprenticing under you, and we get what this is like, and we're, we feel like we are not going to shrink in the spotlight. So yes, we could sit at your right hand and we can handle the pressure and, and whatever sort of fame there goes along with this, and we can handle that. We'll be seated at the head of the table with you. We can do that. And Jesus is actually talking about something, of course, very different. But both James and John and their mother think, yeah, we're up for the challenge, whatever that challenge is. The thing about this particular request, though, is really there's two parts to it. The first part is that it is spectacularly poorly timed. This request of the, of the mother of James and John is just unbelievably bad timing. It's like sort of like when one of my kids, you know, um, like we get into a fender bender and then one of them says, hey, can we get ice cream now? Like, like that kind of thing, you know, just like I can't, no, no, bad timing, terrible timing. This is what happens. Jesus is telling this story to his disciples and he's telling them about this parable and it's about the laborers who go to work in the field. Remember this story? And they're all like hanging out in the town square, and they get hired sort of two at a time all day long. And then at the end of the day, after their hard day's work, they all get paid the same amount. So Jesus has just finished this parable. And he's saying to them, look, it's not necessarily about the order of things. There isn't the same kind of hierarchy that you're concerned with, that the world is concerned with, that's the priority for me. My goal is to bring as many people to be laborers as possible, I'm not as worried about the pecking order. So he shares this parable with him. And then the next thing he says is he foretells his death. And he says these exact words. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it. This is starting in verse 17. While Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves, and he said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. I mean, these are pretty sobering words. I told you this parable, or I'm explaining this to you. Now I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna foretell about my death. So I will be handed over to death, and they'll be handed over to the Gentiles. I will be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day, he will be raised. Next verse. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons and asked this special favor. Like, how tone deaf are you on the timing of this request, right? I mean, this is, like I said, it's spectacularly poorly timed. There's no hierarchy. There is no pecking order. I'm going to die by this brutal death. Hey, can my boys sit at your right and left hand? Like, that's the timing of things. And so we hear this request, and, and it just shows, yes, the timing is spectacularly bad, but it goes to show that there is just a disconnect between what's going on and what Jesus is teaching and the rest of the disciples. And the mother of James and John, who apparently is just tagging along that day. And so all of this happens, and, and Jesus has got to be kind of just racking his brain again, thinking, you, you're missing the point. So again, I don't think that the request is, is bad. She's just a mom trying to do what's best for her sons. And yet, it's misguided in its timing and actually in terms of missing the point of what Jesus is saying. To further emphasize this, think about the request. 
sit at your right and left hand. It, this is not a, a vision of a throne room, okay? This is not Jesus in some sort of heavenly castle sitting in the throne room at the center of the room on the throne and there is a minor chair to the right and a minor chair to the left. That's not the vision. What they're talking about is a feast, a banquet, where the host of the table or the hostess sits in the primary spot and the person to the right and the left are the honored guests. It's a banquet image that's being asked about here. So Jesus tells a parable, just to make it super clear, about a banquet and about where you sit at a banquet. You may remember this story from Luke. Jesus tells a story and he says, if you get invited to a banquet, don't go sit in the seat of honor. Sit further down the row. Humble yourself. If the host asks you to sit closer, then you will be honored. But why don't you take it down a notch? Humble yourself. Jesus is helping them to realign where their priorities should be. Then if we fast forward a little bit further in the story, we get to the next time after this request has been made by the mother of James and John to the next time we actually have a meal. And that meal is the Last Supper. And Jesus once again demonstrates through his actions what he has been trying to communicate verbally all this time. They arrive to this meal, a Passover meal, they've got this place, they've got maybe a feast they're thinking, and they walk into this simple room, they're probably seated on the floor, Jesus has some unleavened bread and a glass of wine. And that's the big meal. That's the big feast that he has prepared for them. And then he stops and he stoops, drops to a knee before each one of them and washes their feet. It makes Peter so uncomfortable that he says, I don't think I can let you do this. You're going to have to. If you're going to understand what I'm saying, you're going to have to let me do this, Jesus says. He washes their feet, and then he feeds them the bread, and then he feeds them the cup. And when they have the cup, and it's passed to his right and his left, he says, this is my blood poured out for you and for many. This is about forgiveness of sins. This is about a new covenant. This is about sacrifice, servanthood, humbling yourself. And Jesus said, I'm going to show you what real servanthood looks like. We only hear about the mother of James and John one other time in Matthew's gospel. Interestingly enough, it's at the crucifixion. And they're standing there at the foot of Golgotha. And it's Mary, Jesus' mother. It's Mary Magdalene. And Matthew also says the other woman that's there is the mother of James and John. The last time she saw Jesus, she asked him if her sons could be at Jesus' right and left hand. And as she looked up onto that hill and saw Jesus hanging on the cross, she looked to his right and to his left and saw two other men hanging on crosses. And I think at this point, she begins to understand the nature of her request. I don't think you know what you're asking, Jesus said. Are you able to drink from the cup that I am able to drink from? Are you able to truly humble yourself? Are you able to face whatever it is that comes along with being at my right and my left? And my guess is that she had a whole different perspective in that moment. This lesson from Jesus is about discipleship. And it's also, for many of us, about parenting. While we might try to give our kids every advantage, while we might try to pull the strings as much as possible, while we might try to do everything that we can to elevate our children above others, Jesus says that the real way to leadership in this world is to be humble. 
to model it, to teach it, to show that to your children so that the next generation might not grow up to seek power, to lord it over other people, but instead so that they might serve them, that they might show what equity and justice and love and grace and godliness look like. It's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson for all of us. And yet, it's pretty clear that this is what Jesus is teaching. Now, I guess in a weird way I take comfort in thinking about the 12 men that Jesus taught. He mentored them. He loved them. They lived life with him. They walked through, they walked in his footsteps. They they learned from him. They learned from the master. And yet they still didn't get it. They still couldn't quite find the perfection that they were looking for. And it gives me, I guess, a sense of relief to know that we too are a work in progress. So as I've said all along throughout this sermon series, if we're not the perfect family, if we're not the perfect parents, the perfect spouse, the perfect children, cut yourself a little slack. Jesus didn't really have perfect disciples. But he teaches us to strive for servanthood, to make changes that lead to better lives for us and for our families, to work for a different kind of way of living in the world, a way that looks upside down from the ways that we are often taught or society reinforces for us. And we live into a different kind of identity in Jesus Christ, humbleness, sacrifice, servanthood. And while those things maybe sound very difficult and even kind of unpleasant, here's the thing that we know as Christians, that there is a peace that we find in ourselves when we begin to adopt these kinds of behaviors. There is a kind of joy that we find in satisfaction and and, and holiness and closeness to God that is different than any other feeling that we experience in our lives. And so I invite you today to take a step back from power, to take a step back from prestige, to take a step back from the things that the world says, this is what you strive for, and instead take a step in humbleness, take a step in in, in servanthood, and most of all, take a step forward in Christ-likeness. I was reading a commentary on this particular passage of scripture this week. It's by a, a guy named David Howell. And he ended it by saying, you know, maybe the, there's a prayer that comes to mind that sort of represents all of this idea so well. And it's a prayer that many of you will know. It may sound very familiar because it's been set to music many times. but as I conclude the sermon this morning. I want, instead of just me praying, I'd like us all to share in this prayer together, known as the prayer of St. Francis. So if you would, let's pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. It feels countercultural, but that is good news. It's a joyful thing. And when we begin to live this way, we feel a different kind of peace, a different kind of wholeness, a different kind of holiness, and a different kind of satisfaction in our souls.